Bible talks about God's love just about as much as it talks about anything. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 that I've loved you with an everlasting love. One translation of Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and your unfailing love will follow me all the days of my life. One of my favorite passages about God's love comes from Psalm 136. Says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To Him alone who does great wonders, His love endures forever. Who by His understandings made the heavens, His love endures forever. Spread out earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Now I don't know where everybody is this morning. But I do know that God's love, it endures forever. Amen. Join us as we see higher than the mountains that I
when, when I first heard the text of that song on the radio, I've never been so convicted in all my life. The words of that song penetrated my heart. Help me understand what your plan is for my life and what your plan is for my faith. Oh, there's too many times spouse to expectation God that I can even live up to. They're unrealistic and Lord most of them are even uncommunicated. I spend the majority of my time if I'm not careful pointing the finger at someone else when the problem is really right here with me. Lord I'm, I'm praying that over the last few minutes as we look at the text of that song Pray God that healing and understanding just took place. In, in that song, God, we see such a beautiful illustration of the church. Lord, we are a group of unperfect people that will assemble together to do together what no one of us could do apart. And that's what marriage is. And isn't it interesting that you would choose to use an illustration of marriage? To help us understand how the church works. And so, Father, Lord, if we can be patient with one another inside this realm of the body of Christ, help us to be patient with our spouses. Help us to understand that we're two imperfect people that you have brought together to do life together because we're better together. If you have your copy of Scripture, I invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse number 12. Philippians chapter 3. I wrote this sermon several weeks ago, and then, uh, actually this is what I was supposed to deliver last week, and God has a wonderful sense of humor. Amen. And uh, my opening was my opening statement in the sermon is as Paul sat under house arrest in Rome. <laughs> yeah. If you've ever been in the hospital, you can understand what house arrest is, right? Those people are evil. <laughs> you know, they wake you up and tell you to go back to sleep. And they put you to sleep only to tell you to hurry up and wake up. It's messed up. But it's good to be here. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your cards and notes. Um, all your concern. Um, God, has been, God has been good to us. And I'm so incredibly thankful. But as Paul said under house arrest in Rome. He had to have time to reflect. On all the things that he had been through in life. Then as he began to sit down and to pen his letter. To the church in Philippi, I'm sure he began to relive all the things that had taken place in the early church, in that particular church, and all the things that had taken place in his life as a result of their ministry. I'm sure that as he was there in that in that house arrest in Rome, that he thought about this lady named Lydia. She was an incredibly talented lady. She had the finest fabrics in Philippi. 
Though she was known not only for her fabrics, but she was known for her faith and her fear of the Lord. And God would, oh, he would use her in a very instrumental way to help Paul launch the church there in that city. I'm sure that Paul relived the encounter that he had with, with the demon-possessed young lady. I don't know if you remember her story or not, but that she, she was demonically possessed and, and some of the people of that city were using her kind of as, as a sorcerer, as a fortune teller. And they brought her to, to Paul, and, and Paul, through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the power of Jesus Christ, saw her delivered from the demonic spirits, and, and all those that were making money off of her, they were outraged, they were angered, and as a result, Peter fi or Paul finds himself in a, a Philippian jail. I'm sure that as Paul began to re relive those things, all of a sudden, I'm sure he remembered the beatings, he still had the scars from them. But I'm sure that he remembered how, how he and, and his partner, they were sitting in that jail cell together and they were shackled, they were bound hand and foot. And, and maybe the, the only thing they could think of was to sing the, the lyrics of Amazing Grace. I know they weren't written yet, but let's just play with me for a second. And, and all of a sudden, God sent revival down to that Philippian jail. You remember the story, the ground began to shake and all the stalks, their, their bounds were loosened and revival took place. And before the end of the night, a Philippian jailer in his entire household has come to faith in Jesus Christ. It were moments like that that Paul relived, that he thought about, that he treasured. And Paul had one motive, and that was to hurry up, get out of where he was, and get back to see those who meant so incredibly much to him. But as he's sitting there, and he begins to pen his letter, he does so for a couple of reasons. One, he wants to express his gratitude to the church in Philippi for their contributions to the church, but also to their contributions that they had made to him individually. So a part of his letter is just a big thank you for what you're doing, for what you've done. But he also began to write them to encourage them not to let the things of this world creep into the body of fellowship and to divide them. He began to encourage them to labor together, to continually strive to fulfill the call that God had placed on their lives, that God had placed on their church. And he desperately wanted them to realize of the power that they had as a church and that they as a church were guaranteed the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. But as Paul began to pen the letters, so he began to relive the moments that he had spent with them. He became aware of, of the danger, and really that danger affects a lot of us today. And that's the danger of yesterday. See, the church then as well as the church today, sometimes we fall into the habit of thinking and believing that all God has done is all that God's going to do. And you'll hear me say this probably again and again throughout this message. That as long as God is still on the throne. And as, as long as there is still breath left in your body. God still has a plan. And it's not about what God has done. But it's about what God is going to do. Amen. Paul wanted to remind the church. In Ephesus, he wanted to remind the church in Philippi, make the most of every opportunity that God gives you. So the church in Ephesus would say this in Ephesians 5, verse 15. See then they can walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And now if you'll follow along with me in Philippians chapter 3, and if you have your copy of Scripture, I invite you to look at it, whether it's on your app or on, you know, you got the hard copy. I'm going to ask you to highlight some things, underline some things in your copy of Scripture, okay? So Philippians 3 verse 12, Paul says, Not that I've already obtained or have already perfected, but I press on. Would you underline those three words? I press on. That I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus 
has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, would you undermine these first three words of verse 14? I press toward. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you. Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk. Would you underline those three words? Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. I know that we live in some troubling times. I know that on whichever particular day you happen to watch the news, you see things that are horrifying to you. We see a world on a brink of war. Everywhere we look, every continent that we look, we understand the risks that are out there. And in spite of what we see, one of the questions that we must ask ourselves as the church is what time is it? Well, let me give you four things this morning that will help us understand what time it is. I believe, number one, that the time has come to reach our potential. That we're to reach our potential. Look at verse 12 again in Philippians 3. Paul says, not that I have already attained or I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. This is kind of how I interpret that, boy, that verse. Paul is not only saying, hey guys, I haven't gotten to where God wants me to be yet. And I understand that. Paul's not only saying, I haven't become all that God wants me to do. Now I understand that we have this mindset of Paul that when Paul takes off his robe, you know, he's wearing the super S under his shirt. I mean, if there was ever a super Christian, Paul was kind of one of those guys. But Paul doesn't look at himself as a super Christian. He sees himself as someone who hasn't fully realized his potential yet. God's not finished with Paul yet. He's not what he wants to be yet. We're kind of that way, aren't we? I mean, listen, I'm still a work in progress. Amen? But turn to the, look at the person beside you real quick. Look at him. That person beside you is still a work in progress. God's not finished with them yet. But I think it's time that we realize our potential. That we understand that we may not be on the same page as God yet, but we're headed there. We may not be what all that God wants us to be yet, but we're headed there. It's time that we realize our potential. There are really three questions that we need to ask God. Whether as a church or whether as an individual believer, there are three things that I need to know from God. Number one, God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? Now, I believe that that's different for each and every one of us. I believe that God has a tailor-made place for you, a tailor-made place of service for you, a tailor-made culture for you or whatever. I believe that there's a specific place in which God has called you to serve. So God, where do you want me to go? Second thing that I need to ask God, God, what is it that you want me to do? I mean, what do you want me to do, God? And not only that, but finally third, the next question is, God, what do you want me to be? Now, the answer to the first question, where does God want us to be, that may vary. But the answer to the second question, Scripture already answers that. Now, let me give all of you a little bit of hope from God's Word, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Just turn back a couple of pages. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 6. Paul said that I am confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, sometimes we need to remind each other that we're a work in progress. I'm not going to be perfect until I'm dead. That's good news, baby, isn't it? <laughs> uh, maybe the person that said it. If I disappear quickly. Okay? But we're not going to be perfect till we're home. We're a work in progress. Secondly, what does God want me to be? What does God want me to do? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it'll be on the screen. Paul says that we are 
being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. God wants us to be changed. That's what we're to do, to be transformed. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Paul says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and in drunkenness and in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Notice this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. What does God want me to be? He wants me to be like Him. Who does He want me to be? He wants me to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Isn't it time that we reach for our potential? When you ask what time it is, Secondly, I believe the time has come for us to refuse to live in the past. Look at verse 13 in the latter part of that verse. Paul says, one thing that I do, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. See, we celebrate the blessings of yesterday because we owe God all the praise. So we celebrate what God has already done, but we don't stay there. We anticipate the blessings that God has in store for us today, the blessings that God has in store in the days to come. Now, we have to learn lessons from the past. But we cannot be imprisoned by our past. Let me say that a different way. All of us have stuff behind us that we're not proud of, right? All of us have things that we have done that we would do anything to undo, right? I mean, we have moments and secret moments that have been exposed that we're not proud of. And we can let our past haunt us. And we can let our past keep us in bondage. Or we can understand as children of grace that all of my past is under the blood of Jesus Christ. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If Christ Jesus Himself, if God is willing to take my sins and to bury them in the sea of forgetfulness, to cast them as far as the east is from the west, then I can learn to forgive myself as well. And I am no longer in bondage to my past. And we celebrate His grace. And we celebrate it by moving on from yesterday. We let go of the negative because it's under the blood. We let go of the positive because the positive are just building blocks that we need to build on today. Building blocks that we need to build on tomorrow. They're yesterday's successes. You know, the most frustrating I think that I get is when I have the opportunity to kind of talk to some people. And, and one of the things that I like to ask them is, so tell me about, tell me about your daily walk with the Lord. What do you mean, Lord? Tell me about the time that you spent in Scripture today. Um, um. Uh, tell me about your prayer life. Tell me how, 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 many, how many minutes, how many hours of every day or every week you spend on your, on your knees before God. Tell me about your, your personal devotion life with the Holy Spirit, with the Father. Tell me about how you worship Him, your communion with Him. Does anybody really like leftovers? <coughs> Some of you do. How long do you want to live off leftovers? Can I tell you what happens to leftovers after a period of time? Hello? <laughs> they spoil. Right? All of a sudden your leftovers turn into some wicked science experiment. And they're really good, right? Listen, for some of you as believers... You're content on living off leftovers. Living off of what God did yesterday. Or what God taught you yesterday. As if God doesn't have something to say to you today. That God doesn't have a plan for your life today. That God doesn't want to bless you today. But you're content to go back to leftovers when God has something fresh and waiting for you each and every day. Isn't it time? Isn't it time? that we come to reach our potential, that we refuse to live in the past. One person said this, the past is dangerous because if we really, if we really live in the past,
that we fail to live today. And that robs us of our dreams tomorrow. And if we lose our dreams, we lose hope. One commentator said that if we fail to learn from our past, we're fools. But if we never learn to move on from the past, it can be fatal. Churches that live in the past die. Churches that only celebrate the victories of yesterday die. But those churches that embrace the future and embrace the challenges of today and in the future, those are the churches that thrive. Those are the churches that do things for the kingdom of God. When you ask what time it is, number three, the time has come to realize our purpose. Paul says that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I want to do what God says I'm to do. I want to agree with God and what he has called me to do. And, and look on and, and later on in verse number 13 of Philippians 3. He says, I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So what are, the, what are our purposes? You already know this. Our purpose is to worship. That's number one. That we commune with God privately and corporately. That daily we come before God and we openly express all that He is to us, what He means to us, our love and our devotion to Him. Personally and corporately, we give God all the praise that He deserves. Worship is our first purpose. Secondly, our purpose is to discipleship. Our purpose is not to get people to say a prayer. I, I'm sorry, but nowhere in Scripture does it say that my job as a pastor or my job as a Christian is to get somebody to say a prayer. My job as a Christian, my job as a pastor, our job as a church is to make followers of Jesus Christ. We're to go into all the world, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, and make disciples, not to get people to say a prayer, not just to get people into the baptismal waters, but we're to teach and train people to become faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That is my job. That is your job. That is our job as a church. It's time to realize our purpose. Our third purpose is to fellowship. To fellowship. We're to come together as believers. Young and old. Blend together. Encourage one another in our walk with Christ. God never intended for there to be lone rangers in the church. If you're here this morning. And you feel like that you're living the Christian life alone. Either you're doing something wrong. Or we're doing something wrong. Because God didn't call us to live this life alone. Not only did He promise us the gift of His Holy Spirit, but He gave us the gift of the church. And we're to do life together. And it's certainly a whole lot more fun. Amen? I mean, you guys are the most entertaining group I know. It's fun. Fellowshipping together. That's what God has commissioned us to do. To do life together. Help each other grow. Encourage one another. Cheer each other. Correct each other. All of that falls under that area of fellowship. Our purpose is also ministry. God has called each and every one of us to see to the welfare of one another physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We do that in ministry. But not only has He called us to do that for each other as the family, He's also called us to do that for our community. So our job as a church is to meet the physical needs of our community. Our job as the church to meet the emotional needs of our community. And our job is certainly to help our community learn spiritually. And we meet their spiritual needs, not just on Sunday. Our job is ministry. Our purpose is evangelism. Evangelism. We're to take the gospel into all the world. How do we do that? 
Well, first of all, we do it with our tithes and our offerings. John, every time I give, I'm an evangelist. Did you know that? And he said, Brother Mike, you're just trying to reach into my wallet. No, no. Every time we give, I'm an evangelist. Right now, we're, we're focused on world hunger, global hunger. And in giving towards that. Uh, you know, one of, one of our ladies, our senior adult ladies, is, um, is living in a, in a retirement community now. And she was approached by someone of another denomination. And she says, you know what? I really don't understand your, your Baptist missionaries. Because all y'all want to do is, is to get people to say a prayer and you don't do anything to meet their needs. That's not true. You know, when you study the life of Jesus, do you know that he met the physical need before he ever addressed the spiritual need? Did you know that? But he always did both. And so giving to the Global Hunger Fund, I'm, I'm giving to help people share the gospel with food. Because when I take it, when I take food to a hungry person that doesn't have anything to eat, they see and they feel the love of Jesus Christ. And then I can share with them how God loves them and how God has an abundant life for them and how God wants to give them this wonderful place called heaven. And even though the rest of their life may look like hell, God has a wonderful place for them in eternity. That's my job. So as I give to the Global Hunger Fund, I'm being an evangelist. Says, in, a, in a month or so, we'll be, we'll be given to the Hawaii Moon Christmas offering. That is to help share the gospel around the world. And so as I, I, as I give towards the Hawaii Moon, I'm being an evangelist. And as I give to Amy Armstrong, and that's to share the gospel in North America, I'm being an evangelist. And by the way, as I give to our regular tithes and offerings, as I support the general fund budget of this church, I am being an evangelist because 6% of what you give to this church is used in missions automatically. So as I give to the local ministry of the church, this church is then saying, you know what, but we're going to use what you give us to help make an impact in our state, in our nation, and around the world. So one of the ways that I'm an evangelist is by giving of my treasures. Another way that I'm an evangelist is by giving my time my talents, and my testimony. Now, bear with me for a second. God's not going to call all of us to be vocational ministry, or missionaries on the other side of the world. Again, that's one of those significant calls. We talk about where do you want me to go, God, that being specific. God's not going to call us all to be foreign missionaries, international missionaries. Some of you are like, <laughs> Right? But he will call some of us. And when God calls some of us, we get behind them and we support them and we help them. And we get to share in the harvest together. When Brother Matt first came on staff, one of the challenges that Brother Dave had for, for our church was to see us get to a point where we could do our own foreign mission project. And next March, Brother Matt would lead us to El Salvador to work with orphans, to work with school kids, to work with adults who never heard the gospel. And so some of us, 17 right now, 17 of our church family will go as foreign missionaries to share the gospel. You may not be able to go, but you can help be an evangelist by again, giving up your treasures. But God has already put you on mission. See, God placed you in a neighborhood. Students, God placed you in a school. Adults, God placed you in a workplace. And he says, this is your mission field. Now go and make disciples. And we do it with our talents. We do it with our treasures. We do it with our time. Do it with our testimony of just telling other people what God has done to our life. And if God can do this for me, God can certainly do it for me. It's time to realize our purpose, number four. Time has come to recognize the value of one. Look at verse number 12. 
Paul said, not that I have already obtained. He would go on to say, I press on that I may lay hold. In verse number 13, he says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. He would go on to say in verse 13, I forget those things which are behind. I reach forward to those things which are ahead. In verse 14, he says, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God. Before Paul ever addressed the church and the needs of the church, he addressed himself. And he says, these are the things, church, that I must do. These are the areas of my life that I must correct. These are the things in which God is working on me about. But then he would go on to say in verse 16, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. And one of the things that we have to understand as a congregation, as the body of Christ, that each member of the body is vital to the body. That we're all important. You follow me? Now, here's one of the things that I'd like you to do. Take your smartphone out real quick. Take your phone out. Go ahead. I'm giving you permission to look at your phone here in church. <laughs> Turn the camera on. Teenagers, if you have Snapchat, go ahead and open up Snapchat. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead and take your selfie. Good. Take your selfie. You look good. You're somebody you dress really nice. All right. Now, on your caption for you Snapchat people, you're going to add this to your story, right? I am essential. I am essential.
thank you for the way it, it challenges me, the way it encourages me. God, I thank you for the way it convicts me. I thank you for the ways, God, that you hold me accountable through your word. God, I pray in this time, this place, God, that we'll just reflect on what you want us to do, where you want us to go, what you want us to do. And in this place, God, let us surrender to you. As a church, as a couple, as a home, wherever the need arises, God, Lord, I know that you've you brought us together into this place for a specific reason, with a specific message for each and every one of us. God, I pray that you just have your will and your way in this place. God, there's healing that needs to take place here. There's just marriages that need to come together. There's Christians that just need to come together. There's students that just need to come together. Say we're going to do life together, and we're going to make it count for the kingdom of God. Lord, let your will be done in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's see. As the earth leads us, I respond.
Thank you.